asked Peter Grace to take on the responsibility of running this commission. I had no idea the kind of energetic but healthy troublemaking I was contracting for. <laughs> With dedication and selflessness, you succeeded where others failed. You provided clear, concise, and practical recommendations to enormously complicated problems. The public now knows some hope and optimism that government can at last be made lean, cost-effective, and responsive to the people. That's why they're behind the Grace Commission's work, and that's why they're behind our plan for deficit reduction. The bottom line was they found something just under $500 billion worth of waste that could be trimmed out of the government on an annual basis without changing a single program. In other words, you didn't have to cancel welfare. You didn't have to cancel Medicare and Social Security. All you had to do is go in with standard business practices and trim out the waste, the overspending, the double billing, the bills that never got paid on time, those kinds of things. And unlike the people sitting in the middle of the federal government mess who see no problems, uh, they were able to see a lot of problems and project in the future what would happen if things weren't changed. They came to the conclusion that we didn't make some substantial change in the direction of this economy and some substantial reduction in the amount of deficits that we're running, that, it, that the government would reach a point where they could no longer fund themselves either through taxes or borrowing. At that time, uh, many people took it as alarmist and so forth, didn't take it seriously. But the shocking thing is now to go back and look at that report and see it track the projections they made for 85, 86, 87, 88, 89 are tracking within a few percent. And what it's predicting is a major, major collapse of this country. It was this startling information that prompted the co-chairman of the Grace Commission, Harry Figge Jr., to co-author a book to alert the nation's leaders, as well as the citizens at large, to make needed changes. It became a New York Times bestseller. One powerful graph in the book tracks the amount of borrowed money the government overspends each year. Although the levels fluctuate slightly from year to year within the various administrations, on the whole, the spending is increasing and will go off the chart within the next few years. Despite the inevitable consequences of this fiscal crisis, Congress continues to accelerate its irresponsible overspending, which further contributes to the national debt. The Graham-Rudman Act of 1985 made it mandatory for the government to live within its income and to balance the budget by 1991. The Grace Commission tracked the discrepancies between the estimated budgets and the actual spending. Despite the legal mandate, the amounts estimated and spent soared to new heights by 1991. According to the Grace Commission, Congress and the President have been using creative ways to get around the law. One loophole Congress uses is to regularly apply for temporary budget extensions. These extensions were originally designed only to be used in emergency cases. However, their use has now become common practice. Another deceptive practice Congress employs is to siphon the funds out of the Social Security Trust Fund. This allows them to reduce the annual deficit numbers presented to the public. We've been overpaying into the Social Security Fund now for the better part of uh, about six or seven years, and yet it doesn't have a dime in it. It's got a lot of numbers in it. But in truth, the government takes the money out, spends it in the general budget, so they don't have to show that as a deficit, and then substitutes an IOU in the form of zero coupon bond from the government. And since that's a called an internal transfer of government assets, in other words, the government says they own the trust fund. Therefore, when they transfer the money out of the trust fund into the general economy, they don't have to show that as a deficit. So it's lies. Another technique Congress uses to mask excess spending is to transfer budget overruns or excess spending into the next fiscal year. This creates the illusion of reduced spending without incurring the pain of actually making cuts. Another effective way the administration and Congress gets around the law is to shift many projects off budget. Examples of that is the post office. Post office government operation doesn't show up in the budget. It's, they found arguments to take it off budget. The Persian Gulf War. No reason for that not to be in the budget. It's not. They find reasons to take it off balance sheet. Many of the entitlements programs, those are the most scary, are also off balance sheet. 
And um, if you did this in business, you'd go to jail for fraud. The Grace Commission also found that when U.S. debt is compared to the growth of debt in other countries, it's higher and growing faster than all other industrialized nations in the world. Perhaps the most alarming information is presented in this graph, which depicts the dramatic rise in actual U.S. debt. The predictions since 1985 have incredibly been right on target. And if its tracking record remains accurate, in a few short years, the country will be bankrupt. Americans may get the false impression that the budget is being dealt with because it's talked about in nearly every newscast and election campaign. The truth is that very few have been bold enough to confront or even address the truth about the impending financial crash. In light of the accuracy of the Grace Commission's predictions, why didn't Congress fully support their recommendations? Because it was a Republican issue versus Democrats, and the Democrats controlled the, the House and the Senate by that time, most of the Grace Commission's recommendations never got implemented. Some of the recommendations that would save a lot of money uh, require a vote of Congress. And every bit of waste in the federal government has a champion somewhere in Congress who sees that not as waste but as a gravy train. There are forces in this country that keep our entire society off balance with the huge budget uh, deficit that is paramount in this country today. While we hear senators and congressmen talk about wanting to solve the budget problem, I don't think they really want to in earnest. Now the members of Congress know about this spiraling national debt. They know all about it. They're oblivious to it. Some of them don't care. The majority don't care. All they're concentrating on is the next election. 20 years we've been fighting this battle over the budget, and somehow or another, out of all of the brains, out of all of the legal minds in this country, out of all of the people that are running around supposedly the brightest and the best in Washington, D.C., it cannot be solved? No, sir. But somebody doesn't want it solved. In my opinion, our government is not going to try to do it because the, the uh, cure is too tough for them to swallow politically. No one I've seen in the press or elsewhere deals with the problem quantitatively. They'll arm wave, they deal in platitudes, this is fraud and deceit. It's like an alcoholic who says, I'm going to reduce my consumption. What he really means is, I want to maintain the right to continue drinking. And that's precisely what our leaders in Washington are doing. They talk about reducing the deficit, but what it really gives them is nothing more than the opportunity to continue to borrow money and increase the debt. There's too much government, especially in Washington, and there's too much spending. We could cut out programs, we could cut back on programs, and people have got to quit just looking to the government to solve the problem. That's not the American way. Washington is irrevocably out of control. There are no controls, there's no responsibility, no one's held accountable for the decisions. And uh, to make the decisions to save this country, you, you guarantee you won't be reelected. So as a result, we are in deep trouble financially. The problem is an almost total disregard for any moral constraints in Washington. They don't feel any guilt about the fact that they spend more of our money than they raise. They don't feel any guilt about the fact that they don't account for our money properly. There are good people in Washington, to be sure. But most of them, like Warren Rudman of New Hampshire or Bill Armstrong of Colorado, have quit in disgust and left the place. And who does that leave running it? People who are willing to borrow and spend to purchase our votes. What do you do when the U.S. government doesn't have the money to pay its bills? Um, there are experts have different theories. You could have a collapse of the government. That's what's happened in other countries. The scenario that most people uh, tend to presume will be hyperinflation. In other words, they'll print money to make the money, and that will cause uh, the, you know, the, the money supply to increase, which will cause more inflation. They will do what every government has done that's ever existed in history, and they will start to print money. They will inflate the economy so they can pay their bills. But for every dollar they print, my dollar goes down in terms of value. If they print two, mine goes down about 50 cents. They'll begin to print money as soon as we are not willing to pay any more in taxes. And they'll have to print money in order to pay their bills. The Germans after World War I did it. When they could no longer pay their bills, 
and they couldn't raise the money through taxes. They had taxed the maximum, and they were on the edge of revolt. They started printing money. Three years later, just three years later, the mark was worth 2.4 trillion marks per dollar. Money was worthless in Germany. It would take a basket full of money to go buy a loaf of bread, but you couldn't afford the basket, so it was irrelevant. Once you hyperinflate the dollar, it doesn't matter if you have a million dollars in the bank, it's worthless. Uh, Argentina was once one of the most uh, richest nations in the world, rivaling the United States uh, 50 years ago. Uh, but they went into hyperinflation and badly, badly damaged their economy. Within about a six-month period of time, the inflation rate in Argentina was at about 500% per year. Before they stopped the cycle, it was 5,000% per year. Well, when you have hyperinflation and the government prints a lot of money, two things happen. One, wages fall uh, because they're just, in real terms, they're not worth as much. But the most devastating thing is that savings and investment gets wiped out. Uh, if you had $100,000 in the bank and the government starts printing money, $100,000 could be worth $50,000 or $10,000 in no time at all. Whole families plans for the future, pension uh, plans, insurance uh, plans. Uh, inflation can destroy uh, the wealth that has taken a, a generation or a lifetime to, to build up. And so this is where the middle class gets absolutely wiped right out. All of our savings, all of our bank accounts, all of our life insurance, all of that goes right down the tubes. As soon as investors see that America is not a good investment, jobs will fall like dominoes. Yours might not be the first to go, it might not be the second to go, but there's no question that sooner or later, you will be laid off. You will not be able to depend on your government to employ you. You will not be able to depend on any major uh, consortium like General Motors to continue to employ you. I think we're gonna have massive defaults with people losing their homes and losing their businesses and everything they've owned. And the hyperinflation scenario literally means a collapse of the economy as we know it. That generally leads to anarchy. We're going to have increased riots like we experienced in Los Angeles. I think that's just the beginning. You've got large segments of the population that are unemployed, out of work, probably not even employable in terms of literacy rates. And uh, so you've got the makings of major civil unrest. If they can't maintain law and order when a verdict comes down that no one likes, how are they ever going to be able to maintain law and order when the actual government that's in charge of the currency has destroyed it? That which happened in Los Angeles is not apropos just to Los Angeles. All of the big cities across our country, the inner cities have the same tensions. They could erupt 